Happy Easter. Happy Divine Mercy Sunday. Thank you. We are uh, certainly still in the the octave of Easter, so we celebrate today the way that we did last Sunday. Right? So remember, if we if we think back to the uh, Christmas season, we talked of the the letter the number eight. If we turn the number eight on its side, it's the infinity sign, right? So number seven is a perfect number, and the number past perfect is infinity. So we're still celebrating today as if it was that first day, because it is for us. And because it's still Easter for us, I think we should uh, do our best to overuse words that we weren't really allowed to during Lent. So uh, this morning... When I say the word Amen, I want you to respond with Hallelujah. Amen. But I want you to say it like Jesus is truly risen from the dead, because it's true. And if I say the word Hallelujah, I want you to respond with Amen. Hallelujah. Wonderful. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. He is risen as he truly said. Hallelujah. Jesus tells us, he gives us the example that death no longer has power over him and therefore no longer has power over us. Amen. That not even physical elements could contain the Lord. He passes through the stone for the resurrection. He passes through the door. Physical things do not bind our Lord and therefore they do not bind us. Hallelujah. Last week on Saturday night, we had the Easter Vigil. People receive graces sometimes for the very first time ever in their life. Some others made a solemn profession before Almighty God and this community that they be faithfully Catholic. How powerful is that? Amen. Sometimes, again, for the very first time, they receive sanctifying grace to live uncommon lives in a very common world. There are witnesses to us. Hallelujah. And now those same people get to sit with us today as regular Catholics. They're one of us, and it's truly powerful. Amen? We're growing as a church. More people came into the church last weekend. Right? We're growing as a church. The power of the witness of that. Hallelujah? Uh, last week, right before um, Good Friday, I actually came across an article that was kind of making its rounds um, on the Internet. It's from uh, Gallup. I don't know if that's the name of the company or the, the group that did the actual stats, but um, they came up with this, this article on uh, March 29, 2021. And it says, U.S. church membership falls below majority for the first time. So it says on here, This is the opening lines of the document, of the article. Americans' membership in houses of worship continued to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's eight-decade trend. In 2020, 47% of Americans said they belonged to a church, synagogue, or mosque, down from 50% in 2018 and 70% in 1999. Now, the article continues, giving a a whole host of stats, but one of the last things that it says before it ends, it says this. A 2017 Gallup study found churchgoers citing sermons as the primary reason they attend church. Now, that sticks out in my mind for for two reasons. One, am I being an adequate preacher? But two, the sadness that people go to church for for the priest or the pastor and not because Jesus is truly present in the tabernacle. Right? I think that act also shows how poorly we've done, done preaching. Is that you're here for me and not him. The sadness of that. I was uh, intrigued by those stats, and so I decided I would look up some more stats. This is just for Rock Island County. So this is in the United States. It's talking about the whole United States. So I looked up our county. Rock Island County. I know not all of you live in Rock Island County. Uh, Some of you are from Iowa or other places. You're always welcome here. This is as of July 1st, 2019. As of July 1st, 2019, 
The United States Census Bureau tells us that we had 141,879 people that lived in our county. It's a pretty good-sized county. It skips down here a little bit to, to race origins. It says of, uh, of our 141,879 people, 82.6% of them are white people. Black or African American make up 11.1%. American Indian or Alaskan Native make up 0.6%. Alaskan alone, I'm sorry, Asian alone make up 2.7%. Hispanic or Latino make up 13.2%. It skips down and has a whole bunch of other things, but it gets down here to education. It says uh, high school graduate or higher uh, from people polled from 25 years of age or older. So in other words, everyone who's over 25 years old, they, they polled if they graduated high school. We have 88.6% of our overall population in the county that have graduated high school. Pretty smart people. It continues on. This might catch your attention a little bit more. Uh, it gives the um, median household income. $54,858. You people are rich. Persons in poverty, 13.6%. Out of our 141,000 people, 13.6% of, uh, of them are below poverty, live below the poverty line. I was intrigued, so I continued to, to, to search. I wonder if there's religious statistics. I found some. Of our, for our whole county, the three largest faith groups in our whole county are Evangelical Protestants, Roman Catholic, and Mainline Protestants. Well, how many numbers are in each of those? Of the Evangelical, uh, evangelical Protestants, they make uh, 18,447 adherents to their, to their faith. Catholics make up 18,258. So in other words, they, they were only a little bit larger than us by about 200 people. And mainline Protestant is 16,294. Now, I know all of you were able to do math a lot faster than I am, so you already know the stats of this, but I'll give it to you in case you weren't able to get it all in. That means that the evangelical Protestants make up 13% of our overall county. Catholics, Roman Catholics, make up 12.9%. And mainline Protestants make up 11.4%. So, if we look at this... Uh, Evangelical Protestants plus the, the, the Catholic population, but we make up over 25% of our whole county. Right, 25%, that's a good, that's a lot of people. 25% of people in our overall county. If we add in the mainline Protestants, that's like 37%. 37% of our, of our county uh, are celebrating Easter, hopefully in the same way that you and I are right now. That's powerful. Right? We should almost be applauding ourselves. We're so amazing. We have taken away that much chunk of our overall county. Now, uh, I, I wondered, how have those numbers changed over the last 20 years? This is over the last 10 years. How have they changed over the last 20 years? So I looked it up. In 2000, uh, between 2000 and 2010, we were actually, the, the Catholic faith was actually the largest of the faith communities. So either we have shrunk and they have grown, or we're just not making new disciples, and they are. I wondered how much had it shrunk from 2000 to 2010, and it says on this from Glen Mary Research Center, from 2000 to 2010, we had, we had dropped 34.5% of our adherents. So we're getting smaller. Now, let's talk about the largest number of of a denomination. It says number of persons who claim no religion. 84,458 people in our county. Again, unless you, in case you're unable to do the math, uh, that's 59% of our county woke up last weekend and all they had was the Easter bag. All they had was eggs hidden outside. All they had was chocolate to eat that day. 59% of our neighbors, of our friends, of our co-workers woke up with nothing. It's 
pretty sad. Now, if we look at the, the reading, uh, the gospel reading for today, we hear of Thomas who doubts that Jesus Jesus came back from the dead. Now, in a certain sense, we can probably understand his difficulty with this, right? He was just with someone for three years. He saw the person die. He knows that they're in the tomb, right? To just believe they come back from the grave is probably a difficult thing at that time. And he probably fought with the, with the I mean, we know he fought with the, with the apostles. No, I don't believe that. Unless I can see that, unless I can put my hand into his side, I don't believe. And you know what the apostles did, the other, the other ten of them? They didn't abandon him. They didn't say, well, I guess he didn't believe the whole, whole, whole time. Well, I guess his faith is his faith, and I just got to let him go. They stayed after him and brought him to Jesus. They knew they didn't have the right answers. They knew they couldn't explain what it, the questions he was asking. But they knew that they could get him to Jesus. And I'm grateful that they did that for Thomas. It says in here uh, that uh, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now, obviously, he's saying this particularly to the apostles, but the only reason that John writes this down is for you and I to read it for us. Thomas took up that command to go out and spread the gospel. And you know what he did? He went to India. He went to India and he spread the faith in risk of his own life. And I'm grateful for it. And when I was in Bloomington, there was a large population of uh, Indian Catholics there. And so, yeah, there was always, like, Indian Catholic things going on. When I was in college and living uh, at an apartment there, my roommate and I were the only two in our whole block that weren't Indian. And a lot of them were, in fact, Catholic. And they throw some awesome parties. I didn't even know what I was eating most of the time, but it was awesome. Right, the cultural Catholic that they experienced, that I got to experience with them, was powerful. It was a lot of fun. I, I greatly enjoyed it. Right, to see them grow up and how they, how uh, husbands and wives treated each other, and how they, they 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 trained their kids in the faith, it was powerful. And it wouldn't happen if Thomas wasn't willing to do what he did. He took up the Lord's command to go out and get all people. This weekend we also celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday. Uh, so they'll announce at the end of Mass, I guess I will be announcing it at the end of Mass, uh, that they'll have uh, confessions available from 2 to f- two to 3, and then there'll be um, the prayers and everything, the, 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 the chaplet and all the, the, the divine mercy stuff, uh, starting at 3. I hope that you all go to it. We oftentimes think of divine mercy just in the realm of confession, and I don't think that's totally fair to what St. Faustina was talking about in her diary. I think that this is a perfect gospel for Divine Mercy Sunday because it, it, had, it had some to do with, with Thomas being forgiven for doubting, and it has everything to do with the apostles sharing that Divine Mercy with Thomas by bringing him to the Lord. We're obviously not doing a very good job right now in our county of bringing people to the Lord. More and more people every year are abandoning faith or have no experience with faith. And that's a true celebration of divine mercy is me going and, and saying, I don't know how all your answers, but I know Jesus does. If I could just convince one of you to take up the Lord's command, to become a faithful Christian, a faithful Catholic, Right? One of our greatest issues in the Catholic Church is this phrase, I'm Catholic, but. If I say that I'm Catholic, but, and I don't believe in everything that the Church teaches, right, I'm not all in. I'm not that type of disciple. That's the type of disciples that we need is the ones who are all in. If I could convince just one of you to be all in and to take up discipleship in such a serious way that you go out and just convince three other people, and you work in their lives, and you, and you, you, you get into the, the, the dirtiness and mud of their life and share with them Jesus' love and compassion. Next year, we'll bring in three people to the church. If we can convince those three people then to continue on with that mission, two, two years later, we'll bring in nine people. If we can continue on with that, spreading that idea, in three years, we'll bring in 27 people. In four years, we bring in 81 people. 
And in just five simple years, we bring in 243 people. 243 is more than what we have in this church. If just one person is willing to take up the Lord's command to go out and share the faith, in five years, our church would be double the size. Or at least our congregation this morning would be double its size. What if we continue on with that trend? In 10 years, we'd bring in 59,049 people. 84,000 people out there do not believe. If just one person was faithful enough, in 10 years, we'd take out a huge chunk of that. I'm intrigued now. What about 15 years? If just one person was faithful enough this morning to go out and take the gospel command, in 15 years we'd bring in 14,348,907 people. I looked up just because I was intrigued. I wonder how many people, people are in our whole state. We have 12,000, I'm sorry, 12,830,683, 8, 8, anyway, 12 million people, almost 13 million people. If just one person was faithful enough, in 15 years we'd convert the whole state. Well, what about 20 years? Let's just keep the ball rolling. In 20 years, if one person is faithful enough today, we would bring in 3,486,784,401. Imagine what that Easter vigil would be like. Is there just one person here that's faithful enough? Now, I, I've heard at the other masses, so I get it. Well, Father, like... You know, I got to work on Monday, and I got kid stuff, and you know all that stuff. Okay, fine. Don't go after the three. Go after one. Can each of you just get one more person for next year? Imagine that. There's let's say 250 people here today. 200, 200 people. If each of you just got one, 400 people would be in this church right now. If half of you were willing to take that up, there'd be 300 people in here. If just a quarter of you were faithful, we'd bring in 50 people. Imagine that Easter vigil, bringing in 50 people to the church. How powerful that would be. I hope that all of you have in mind, who, who of my friends and my neighbors and my coworkers and people that I interact with regularly, who of them do not know that God loves them? There's 84,000 people right here that do not know God's love. Which of them do I know? How am I going to engage in their life in such a way that I'm going to, I'm going to even deal with the, the muddiness and, and the, the, the unfortunate things? And I'm going to share with them God's merciful love, His divine love. I'm going to take up the gospel commission, and I'm going to share with, with that person what they've never experienced before. It also implies that I have then experienced it. When we talk of the 18,258 people, Right, to all of them, are they all totally bought in? And unfortunately, I think we've seen in the church that, no, not all of them are totally bought in. Right, imagine this. Imagine you working for Coca-Cola, and you saying, yeah, I work for Coca-Cola, but you should know, like, there's like 5% of what they do and say and believe that I totally disagree with. You'd be fired but that's what we do to our faith. We discourage others by not being all bought in. Right, it's true. Today we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead, that death no longer has power over him, and because of that, he invites us into a relationship with him and God the Father that death does not conquer us either. And we can experience eternity in heaven. And our only responsibility is to help others have that same experience. So when we say that Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, let us totally mean it. Let us totally mean it. How powerful today on the second Sunday of Lent, the second Sunday of Lent, second Sunday of Easter, where we celebrate true divine mercy and God invites us into that. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Amen.
He is risen as He truly said, Alleluia. And He invites us into a, a particular type of relationship that will radically affect those around us and radically affect the world. Let us have a true happy Easter this year by allowing others to experience the real resurrection.